Hello there, I'm Lisa Burkhart Worley, and welcome to Pop Talk, the show where you never know what topics might pop up. We are coming to you from the National Religious Broadcasters Convention where a lot of us Christian media folk gather every year. It's an amazing event. Uh, we come here to connect, we come here to learn from each other, and a lot of times we have divine appointments, so we're really excited about that. And you're gonna love our show today, our first show here at NRB. We wanna thank Chuck Reich and Overcomers Television for uh, hosting us, as well as Frank Speech, that's Mike Lindell's uh, platform, so we're just thankful for them. And also for our sponsor today, which is Prestige Development Properties. But guess who made it to Orlando, Florida with us, uh, our Pop Talk co-host, Michelle Burton to my far right and Renee Rollins to my immediate right. Welcome, ladies. We're going to have some fun this yes, week. Yes, we are. Oh, yeah. Non-stop action. <laughs> well, our first guest is someone I've known for a very long time, and we've never met in person. Can you imagine that? But she's been in other states, and, and I just really admired her work. Her name is Lane Lawson Craft. Lane is an award-winning, best-selling author. She's a popular media host and an in-demand speaker. <laughs> and I know Lane used to produce a magazine called Woe Magazine because my testimony is in one of those magazines from way back. And it was an amazing magazine, very polished, beautiful magazine. But she has a book out, and we're going to talk about that today. It's called The Parents' Battle, Battle Plan, Warfare Strategies to Win Back Your Prodigal. Now, my prodigal is grown now. He's still a prodigal, still praying for them, but uh, for him. But those of you still raising prodigals, I'm sure that you're going to want to purchase this book. So, Lane, it is so great to finally meet you, and welcome to Pop Talk. And, and I, I just have a heart to help parents as, yes. as you do with their prodigals. Why do you have a heart to help them? Yes, well, first and foremost, thank you all sure, for having have me you. because this is an urgent message. We are facing times like we've never seen as parents. So why do I have a heart for it? I had three prodigals. I had three children in three years. So they were all teens and young adults all together. And each one of them struggled in an individual way with the lure of the enemy. So it is very important today that we talk about how do we bring our children back? People ask me, what is a prodigal lane? And what I mean by prodigal, maybe a child that's not in the values that you raised them or the faith or it could be an alcohol issue, drug issue. But my heart is to give parents today hope that any prodigal can come home. Amen. Well, it's not getting any easier for teenagers these days either. Porn is everywhere, drugs are easy to get, and alcohol is accepted. And your own children succumb to a lot of these temptations. So as a mom, what did not work for you when you were trying to help your kids? Well, you know, we are one click away today. Yes. Parents are facing something we've never seen before. We are one click away from a dirty picture coming in, one going out, bullying. Wow. So as I look back, I wish I would have known. We were right on the edge. Uh, my kids are now 32, 30, and 29, and they were right on the edge of the iPhone. So, you know, as many of the founders have said, they don't even let their own children do it. So what did I do wrong? I probably would have waited a little longer for the technology to get in their hands. Yeah, and Lane, you made it your mission to partner with God in this quest to bring your prodigals back. So tell me what that looked like for you. Yes, well, you know, first and foremost, I looked at myself and I said, am I living in a way that models what I want my children to do? So I first became exactly. accountable to myself. And then I began to partner with God. And what I mean by that, God was our first prodigal father. He had two children, Adam and Eve, gave them a beautiful garden. Gave them food, gave them everything. And he said, just don't do this one thing. And what did they do? <laughs> the, the one, one thing. thing. <laughs> so God knows intimately what a broken heart looks like with prodigals. So, um, you know, I just really think that's important to acknowledge that you're not alone in this. And then just go, Father, please help me. You know, he asked us. When we got these children, he formed them in our womb. It says he hand knit them in our womb. So he is asking and trusting us to steward these children, That's so right. partner with them. I love that. I've never thought of God as a prodigal mm. father. That yes. is amazing. He had two kids that yes. kind of went astray, yes. didn't he? Yes. How did he handle it? He 
threw him out of the house. But yes. anyway, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> you know, when I had uh, my prodigal, when he was a teenager at home, uh, I, I don't want to go into all the details, but there was a lot of anxiety and stress um, in the home, and sometimes I just, I just feared. You know, I yes. just I was fearful. Yes. And, and tense. And so how do you have peace in the midst of that storm with your prodigals? Well, you know, first and foremost, again, our culture tells us to be best friends with your children, right? Well, you can't be best friend and a, an effective parent. Amen? Amen? So I first tell parents, just reestablish authority. First and foremost, you have the last say, and you can do new rules at any day, new mercies every day. So, you know, I have a whole chapter about evicting enablement. And so parents can find ways that they can bring back the conversations, bring back rules that can be followed. It's not easy though, it's not easy. And listen, do any of us make changes comfortable? You know, if we're comfortable, do we get, no. So I, listen, it's okay if you hear, Mama, I hate you, or Mama, you don't understand. Listen, that means wink, wink. You may be on to something because we can't change without becoming uncomfortable. When I think of the story of the prodigal son in the Bible, an example of how our Heavenly Father welcomes prodigals back when they repent. As parents, how important is it to forgive our children for their behavior? Well, I think there's a fine line, again, because we can love our child and not love the sin in our child. That was really hard for me. As I said, my son was 15, I mean 15 years before he came back, not 15 weeks or 15 months. So what happened with Stephen early on, about 12 or 13, a child, another child, I call him child at 12, um, showed him porn. And he believes that was the beginning of a very dark journey uh, for his prodigal ways. So um, what I want to tell a parent today is no prodigal is ever too far gone for God. And God's love is unconditional. But again, we can love our children, but we cannot love the sin that they continue to be in. Now, I'm constantly praying for my prodigal, constantly, almost every day. And he's a successful businessman right now in his, in his 20s. He's, he's hit a home run. And, and so I was at his office, officing out of there uh, in Denver. And uh, I was, uh, he came and goes, what are you doing? Are you selling our product? You know, I said, no, no, I'm praying for you guys. And then, you know, that, nobody liked that. But, but I'm still, I am. I'm praying for him. I'm praying for some of the people there. I, I want him to come to know the Lord because I know he, I can see the potential in him. Yes. So is prayer important? How prayer is important? How important was prayer for you when you were going through that with three prodigals? Right. Well, the strategy is that prayer is your ultimate weapon. Back in the day, Lisa, I began this prayer process for years and years and years. And it was, the, it was a, a paintbrush soaked in the blood of Christ. And I would draw this paintbrush on my children's back and say, Father, in the name of Jesus and the blood of Christ, Please protect them, first and foremost, and then give them your wisdom, because I knew the wisdom of God would bring them back around. I did this again for Stephen, my eldest, 15 years before God touched wow. him supernaturally in an Uber driver car. So you can get more about that because it is powerful. All three of my children did have supernatural experiences with God that really changed their lives instantly. But I say two things. You are not in war with that child. You're in war with the enemy out to seek, kill, and destroy him. Yeah. And then I say, if you're not praying for your child, who is? So begin praying, and I believe 100% in the power of blood of Jesus Christ. And wouldn't Amen. you say that it's really not up to, I mean, we maybe they will come to know the Lord or come back uh, through us or through our example that we set, but usually it's from somebody else that crosses their path. Yes. That makes sense. Is that right? Absolutely. And I, again, we continue to water. You know, we plant the seeds, we water it, and allow God to bring people to water it further and allow God to bring someone to harvest. Yes. Anybody have another thought about prodigals? Has any, have you guys had a prodigal or? I have a prodigal, she's still continuing. Um, yes. she, she says that she believes, but the it's, it is definitely a process. It's a journey. It is. And it takes time. It's not something that happens overnight. And it's just the power of prayer is so powerful and I just believe the the one thing that has helped me is just boundaries making sure that yes. you have proper boundaries yes. as a parent yes. is very helpful are there any suggestions that you would give the parents out there well I first and foremost take the shame and guilt off 
Listen, mm. we are in an urgent time where the enemy yes. is everywhere. It's in our culture, it's in our politics, wow. it's even in some churches. Yes, it is. So, you know, we as parents are like, God, you are going to have to step in. And so, you know, that was a big thing for me. Uh, I think a lot of parents today are embarrassed. They're like, right. why is my kid acting this way? Why are they walking away from their faith? Right. Listen, I want to give you some peace today and let you know you are not alone and God is right there with you and believe, believe that God will bring your prodigal back. Amen. What would you say is one of the most important things that you talk about in the book? I think the most important thing is that God really is our Father. When we see that we're His children and that He gave us a stewardship for these children, you have a different perspective and you start stepping in, partnering with God, praying for your child, and standing yes. in expectation that the blood of Jesus Christ through your prayers will bring them home. I have a Rembrandt print of the prodigal son. I don't know yes. if you've ever seen that, yes. but I have that in my office because I was a prodigal. You know, I, I went off for 17 years and, and came back and rededicated my life to Christ and never looked back after that. I was a, a follower at that point. And so even all of us probably have our moments where we fell away and, yes. and have come back. And I put that painting in my office because I, I want to remember about how the Lord brought me back and how he does love and yes. he does forgive yes. all the things that yes. I yes. did yes. in my life, which aren't pretty. Yes. Right. I wish I could undo a right. lot of that stuff, right. but it's there, but he washes as white as snow. And I'm just so thankful yes. for that. Any last thought that you would like to leave for struggling parents? If there's a struggling parent right now watching, right. what would you say to them? I would say never give up that each child has to their last breath to bring back their love for you and for the family and for Jesus and himself. So don't give up. It took a long time for me. There are people that, you know, just need the hope that, you know what? God can do the impossible. And he certainly did it for all three of my prodigals. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Lane, yes. For joining us yes. on Pop Talk. I want to go ahead and again say that Lane's book is called The Parent Battle Plan Warfare Strategies to Win Back Your Prodigal. And you can find Lane's book on her website, and it's lanelawsoncraft.com. But I'm going to spell Lane. It's L-A-I-N-E, lanelawsoncraft.com. Yes, and anywhere else books are sold. Okay, yes. great. Yes. Well, we need it. We yes. need those books. Let's yes. put them out there everywhere. Yes. We want to make sure yes. that uh, people yes. get your book yes. because I imagine there are a lot of people watching right now who have prodigals yes. and they're going to hastily find your book. Amen. Thank Amen. you Thank so much. Thank you for much. being on the show. Yes, Lane. this is so Absolutely. Thank, Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. Hi, I'm Michelle Burden, and our next guest here on NRB is Christine Clarity McDonald. Christine is an internationally recognized author, speaker, and consultant. She experienced two decades of homelessness, addiction, human trafficking, commercial sexual exploitation, 103 arrests, and seven stints in prison. She was left totally blind after choosing the life of her unborn child over medication that would have saved her eyesight. But she overcame this and her past in the human trafficking industry to help others. Christine has received numerous awards including the 2009 Inspiring Change Honor and the 2010 Ex-Offender of the Year Award from the Kansas City Crime Commission and the Second Chance Foundation. Welcome, Christine. Thank Can you, you give us a little background on how you ended up homeless and in human trafficking? <laughs> yes, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here at NRV. Um, and um, yeah, um, I grew up um, in a fatherless home, um, in and out of the foster care system. And because of those things, um, those made me very vulnerable. Um, sexual abuse, right? My mother was an addict. There were a lot of just really kind of messy things. Um, those things, in and out of the foster care system, um, <laughs> really not having a place to belong. 21 different schools, not much time to learn how to read and write. <laughs> Um, I, I decided in my own, like, brilliant 15-year-old brain <laughs> that I, I knew better than, of course, the system that had failed me greatly. And right. um, so I headed out on my own as this homeless, vulnerable 15-year-old youth that had been abused and, and really a throwaway kid, a society's throwaway kid, right? And um, in that, um, I was befriended by a gentleman um, that uh, 
he, uh, he literally said, hey, uh, you need a lift? Because I was staying in an abandoned house and I was hungry and I was cold. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, I didn't really have a plan because, well, I was a 15-year-old trauma-impacted person. And um, uh, he, he had a job for me. My job was to sell flowers and honky-tonks. Um, and so I would go in and I would just uh, sell these flowers and I'd get paid a little money. He gave me a place to stay. He didn't ask me any questions. So in my mind, I was like, I'm safe. He's not touching me. I'm not being harmed. I have food. Um, and I'm not in the system, and I'm not being sent back home. Right. And with that, I, um, in that time, over several months, as he had earned my trust, we would call this grooming, um, he uh, told me, hey, um, I'm going to be out of town for work for a few months, and I care about you. You've been a great employee, and I want to make sure you're taken care of. He did two things. The first thing he did is he handed me an ID that actually had the fake name that I had given him as I would introduced myself with my bogus name. I was Stacy Carr, and um, I said that, you know, I was 19. Um, and he gave me a fake ID that actually had my name as Stacy Carr and that I was 19 and had a picture on it. And he introduced me to a gentleman that he said was his brother, and he said, because you've been a great employee and I want to know you're looked after and I'm going to be gone, I want my brother, I reached out to him and he's gonna give you a place to stay and he's gonna take good care of you. Um, at that time I had no reason to, you know, I didn't wanna draw a question or concern about like I wasn't who I said I said I was, right? As this 15 year old who just didn't wanna go back in the system. Um, and this gentleman actually sold me to this man for $2,500. And um, the gentleman that he sold me to owned a number of adult entertainment um, facilities in Oklahoma City, Coffeyville, Kansas, and Tulsa, Oklahoma. And from that point forward, I was bought and sold out of the uh, VIP rooms of gentlemen clubs. Um, so, yeah, that's mm. kind of how that all started. Oh, it just sounds horrible. You know, I was a fatherless child as well. My dad died before I was born, and my mom never recovered from that. So oh I, I grew up in a very depressed home. And I can't tell you how many times I thought about running away. Uh, so, you know, I think a lot of girls do that. You, yeah. you grow up, and the father is such an important part of yes. the home environment. Exactly. And when there's not a dad in the home, either <laughs> because of divorce or mm -hmm. because, you know, of a problem, uh, it can and it can really affect yes. the, the little girl, yes. the girl in the yes. home, and so I can see how easily that could have happened to me as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can I can feel your pain and what and what you were feeling, how you wanted to get out and 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 hopefully find a better <laughs> opportunity, a better life. Exactly. It didn't turn out that way. Not so much. What what was it like <laughs> for you, Christine, day to day, and how did you survive? Mm. Well. Today, I can say God, but <laughs> then, of course, I had no comprehension of that. Um, you know, for, for um, the first couple of years, um, you know, I was bought and sold and escorted everywhere I went. Um, at 17, I was then kind of dated, if you will, right? Wasn't bringing the prime money. So they escorted me at gunpoint off the property, and I didn't even know what city or state I was in. And by that point, I had never even been allowed to go to the bathroom by myself. I mean, Wow. In those two years, there was no opportunity for me to leave. And if I were to leave, where was I going to go, right? And, and, and so mm -hmm. a lot of violence um, and, and sexual trauma and things that occurred during those experiences. When they escorted me off the property at, at 17 at gunpoint and said, if we ever see you again, we'll kill you, I had no reason to doubt it. But at that time, for two years, I had never even made a decision about what I'm going to wear or if I was going to eat, wow. much less what I was going to eat. Right? I was completely controlled and possessed. I mean, I had a lock on the outside of my door and was escorted everywhere I went. So here I am, 17, with that much more um, trauma, right? Um, that much more control and that much more vulnerability to me. Um, I ended up in Kansas City, Missouri, um, and um, it didn't take long because by now I've got, like, I'm doing self harm, you know, I've got an eating disorder, I've got an addiction. Um, I was introduced to, to cocaine because cocaine became that, um, it was the tool that A, kept control, B, um, when I would get high, I wouldn't think about the things that were fixing to happen to me, and when I got high, after things were done to me, I didn't have to think about what had happened to me. And so in the midst of all of that, I became a full-blown addict. And, and at 17, a full-blown addict to, to cocaine, right, and then out, escorted off at gunpoint, just totally broken in so many ways um, and even more broken than I was when I started out on my own 
um, in Kansas City, a gentleman was like, what are you doing out here? Just wandering a park, nowhere to go, no way to make a decision, didn't know how to make a decision. Um, he was like, you don't need to be out here, you're not safe. So I'm like, okay. He's like, well, let me, let me buy you dinner. So um, unbeknownst to me, of course, this gentleman was a, a, a pimp, what we call today a trafficker. Um, he, um, he did give me a place to stay, um, and um, he did feed me, and um, within a couple of weeks, uh, I was indebted to him for all the kind gestures <laughs> that he had supposedly rescued me from, and so now I owed him money, and he was my possessor for the next 17 years, and oh so goodness. I was bought and sold on back pages, um, um, street corners, hotels, truck stops. Um, and uh, sometimes 20, 25 people a day. And if you didn't earn your quota, you didn't come inside. Like, um, if you didn't earn your quota, you know, really, um, my, my trafficker was what we call a gorilla pimp. Um, so violence was his tactic of control, um, food deprivation, sleep deprivation, things like that. And so um, a lot of people died along the way. I, I watched a lot of women get murdered. Um, a lot of my friends didn't make it out. And so, um, that would that was kind of my day to day life for seventeen Can't years. Imagine. Cannot yeah. imagine it. No. Christine, you spent a lot of time in jail and I prison, did. but there I there was a time when you almost took someone's life. I did. But you didn't, and it actually was the thing that turned your life around. Can you tell us about what happened? I, I can, yeah. Thanks for asking that. Um, you know, I, uh, I didn't know a lot about God, and I, my mother did not know who my father was, and um, she did not believe in God, so I was never exposed to faith, and of course with my child, it was really hard to believe, <laughs> you know, in, in something, um, because I wasn't exposed to a lot of, of things um, that were very wholesome, <laughs> um, and so um, I had been arrested a number of times, and I was illiterate. Um, and um, I'd never had a job. I was in and out of jails, and I would get out of prison, and I would go to these programs that, that were supposed to help people with criminal past, and um, they would say, because I was illiterate, because I had been, you know, uh, the life that I had been, the addiction so long and so intense, that there was no help for someone like me. They couldn't help me. They would exhaust too many resources for someone. So again, I was re-amplified how disposable of a human being I was. And so, even when I would ask for help, right? And so, finally, um, one of my friends was murdered. And um, there, the corner that my pimp, the territory that he had, um, there were three churches. Three churches oh, on wow. the corner that I worked for many, many, many years. And not once did anybody ever reach out to me when beatings would happen and be pushed out of a car. Or my pimp would be just n never, right? Um, and, and they would come and, come and go and come and go. And I remember one day, I had been at a soup kitchen and you know it's like if you they would tell me that you know how awful we were to get a sandwich how terrible we were we were terrible human beings and we were gonna we were gonna burn in hell and because we were evil and we were wicked and 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 if we would give our lives to Christ right something better would happen and but they never explained like we already knew I mean I already knew I was broken <laughs> I already knew things weren't okay but there were no out. So how does that work? What does that look like? I need more. There was no connection, no relationship. Right. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. And nobody told me the love story of the father that, like, literally was here to die for us in spite of everything, of who we were and the choices we would make. And nobody gave me that love story. But I, I remember sitting on that church step one day, and, and um, if there is a God, if that, that, that little bit that I knew about it was true, and, and he had any type of, of a merciful God that, that I had hoped that might be there. I grasped that, and I prayed, just let death find me today so I don't have to be paid for one more day. Mm -hmm. And um, Guy, it was broad daylight. Guy turns the corner literally uh, right after that. He turns the corner, and um, he flashes his brake lights, which means he's calling me. So I, I jump in the truck, and he smiles. And it's funny that ugly can dress itself up real nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he, uh, he he paid for my services, and he beat me, and he raped me, and it was very violent, and it lasted for many, many hours. I was not in and out of consciousness. And then I he grabbed me by my hair, and um, I, I, I was trying to just stay conscious of what was going on around me. My ears were ringing, and it was just horrible. And he beat me like I was a grown man. And when um, it was over, he had a gun, and he balanced me on my knees, and he said, give me a reason 
to let you live. And I closed my eyes in that moment and said, there is a God and my prayers have been heard. Mm. And um, what I didn't understand then is people like that thrive on fear. And I wasn't scared. I wasn't begging for my life. Right? And what I realized um, as he, I waited for him to pull the trigger and I really surrendered in that moment. The consequences are worse. I learned early on, if you don't fight back, it, it won't hurt as bad and it won't last as long. And I, in that moment, I, I was so mad at this God I finally prayed to. And, you know, um, betrayed me is how I felt in that moment. And um, I got a chance to get the gun. And the tides turned. And I, I looked at him. And I told him to get on his knees. And he looked at me. And when I looked at him, I saw this fear. And in that moment, I was like, had nobody, like, ever in all these years and all this stuff, nobody ever, like, when I was a kid, all these years, ever saw mine. I, I don't understand. And um, I told him to get on his knees, and he did. And he told me about his wife, and he told me about his family, and he told me all the value that he had. And in that moment, um, when I pulled that trigger in that moment, my... My hate and my rage was, and my thought of betrayal from this guy that I had prayed to was enough for me to murder the man. And it probably would have been justified, and I probably would have got away with it. But I emptied the gun into the ground, and I left him there sobbing. I threw the guns, um, I grabbed my clothes, and I wiped the blood from my face. And I knew whether my pimp killed me or not, I didn't care if anybody helped me or not. I was not going to be the same evil that had I had been exposed to all these years. Yeah, and we're almost out of time, Christine, yeah. but can you just talk about, uh, just a, in a short uh -huh. um, uh, statement, about how your life's changed since that day? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so um, today I'm an author of a couple of books, Cry Purple and Same Kind of Human. Today I go into churches and I help them, how do we see the, the hurting all around us? I mean, we can learn a lot through scripture and guided commentary. I mean, I don't know, we can learn a lot from that guy, Jesus. Um, and my faith got catapulted shortly after my exit. Um, I get a job, and um, in three days I go blind, and I'm forced with the choice of medication to save my eyesight um, or the life of my unborn child. And I chose my child, and that really started my faith in understanding the dynamics of being the body of Christ and, and walking in faith and trusting God in everything that we do. Well, you are doing such a great work. I wish we had an hour with you. <laughs> I mean, you have so much to say. And maybe we can have you on Pop Talk again and hear oh gosh, the other side great. of the story as well and all the work that you're doing. <laughs> Thank you for being on Pop Talk today, Christine. You can locate Christine at her website and hear more about it and what she's doing uh, for the Lord. It's ChristineSpeaksMinistry.com. And we'd love for you to check in with us at Pearls of Promise Ministries. You can email us at info at pearlsofpromiseministries.com, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Pop Talk Media. We are also on Instagram at Pop Talk underscore ministries. Check out all our past Pop Talk TV shows at our Pearls of Promise YouTube channel. And thanks to our sponsor, Prestige Development Properties, LLC. If you have a project that needs a commercial developer, Prestige Properties Development is the place to go. You can email Prestige at Kerry, K-E-R-R-Y, at prestigedev.net. And that is Pop Talk for today. We are just ordinary girls who God turned into pearls. We'll see you next time.